Article number 17 states, Since we are to judge of the will of God from his word, which testifies that the children of believers are holy, not by nature, but in virtue of the covenant of grace, in which they together with the parents are comprehended, godly parents ought not to doubt the election and salvation of their children, whom it pleases God to call out of this life in their infancy. Article number 18. To those who murmur at the free grace of election and the just severity of reprobation, we answer with the apostle, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? And quote the language of our Savior. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? And, therefore, with holy adoration of these mysteries, we exclaim in the words of the Apostle, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past tracing out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and unto him are all things. To him be glory for him forever. Amen. Congregation, please open the scriptures to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter two. Just by way of introduction, if you haven't been with us, we've been going through the doctrine of unconditional election. Some would say unconditional personal election, wherein we have seen the truth of this great doctrine of election with some mystery with regard to it and yet we submit to the truth that God is sovereign in all things and directs all things according to the counsel of his own will. Uh, Lord willing uh, uh, this morning we want to deal particularly with first or article 18, article 17 will be dealt with at another time specifically and so we'll be dealing with article 18 and really in summary form uh, the rest, uh, uh, in some reform, the rest of this whole first canon. So let us read, though, from the scriptures, a portion of scripture that is often used as a, a proof text for the doctrine of unconditional election in the scriptures, uh, along with, for example, Ephesians 1 and Romans 9 and Romans 11 as well. Uh, Second Thessalonians is, is another uh, watershed of this great doctrine uh, here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So we'll be reading verses 13 through 17. Here is the reading of God's word, 2 Thessalonians, starting with verse 13 through 17. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work well may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts 
Well, congregation, as you know, we've been going through the doctrine of unconditional election. And we've said that this unconditional election that's given to us in Scripture is personal as opposed to corporate. This election in Scripture has been revealed to us with some mysteries, of course, that are attached to it. We don't have all the answers of unconditional election. For example, we don't know who the elect are. It would certainly be easier in the ministry, would it not, if we knew who the elect were? But God in his grace and in his mercy has not told us who they were, particularly, but he has revealed the doctrine itself. And that is what we proclaim. We proclaim through the word of God the doctrine of unconditional election. But also, as it is summarized in one of the standards of the Reformed Church, and the great synod of Dort, which took place between 1618 and 1619. We have seen from Holy Scripture that this doctrine is fundamental to our thinking about who God is, his being, his decrees, his works, as well as the whole issue of salvation. So when we speak on the doctrine of election, while salvation is surely one of the issues, the greatest issue is how do we know who God is and how are we to understand who he is? The doctrine of election teaches us about who God is primarily and then secondarily as it relates to salvation. The Calvinistic or Reformed position on election is that God sovereignly elects unbelievers and predestines them to become believers based on the eternal love of God in Jesus Christ. And we saw that here, for example, in the text. We see that in 2 Thessalonians 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord. There is a particular love, a special love, that God has for his own people. That, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a general love. Some theologians would rather not use that term, but use the word benevolence. That God you know, reigns his benevolence upon the wicked as well as the, as the righteous. But there is a particular love that is evidenced in scripture that God has for his own. The Arminian, on the other hand, believes in an unscriptural way that God elects really believers and predestines them to come to be his children based on the condition of foreseen faith. And we've seen that that is an unbiblical doctrine. We may state the question in another way, maybe something like this. Does God elect a person because that person wants God? Or does God elect a person because God wants the person in spite of the fact that he is dead in trespasses and sins? Maybe we could put it another way. Does God elect people because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or does God elect people in order that they shall believe in Jesus Christ? Those two are fundamentally different. Augustine said it right when he wrote, God chooses us, not because we believe, but that we may believe. The scriptures teach that apart from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as stated in Romans 1 and in Ephesians chapter 2, God sees only guilty people corrupt in every which way that serves only to arouse God's wrath and condemnation. And as Romans 8 clearly states to us that the natural man does not receive the things of God, nor does he even desire them. The marvel of all marvels in election is not why God elected this person or rejected that person out of his sovereign good pleasure. 
but why he elected anyone like you and me from this guilty and condemned race. And so much of the discussion really centers around why did God do this? And why did God do that? And we've seen in scripture as we have read from the canons of Dort, who are you to question the sovereign hand of God? Who are you as the creature to look up at the creator and say, why have you formed me this way? I think the issue really is more why did you elect anyone at all and we use the example of, of Jacob and Esau and people are so aghast over the the terms in Romans 9 that Esau have I hated but Jacob have I loved I don't know whether you have more issues with God uh, or questioning God in the sense of him hating Esau but maybe the bigger question is why did he love Jacob in summary, the Calvinistic or Reformed doctrinal position is that election finds its soul and all-sufficient cause in the sovereign good pleasure of God. It's stated in Ephesians 1 and Romans 9 and Matthew 11, 2 Timothy 1. Election is the foundation of all saving good which includes faith and holiness and glorification. That God should set his electing love upon any individual is not in any way dependent upon the person's will, his works, his holiness, his obedience. Election. Unconditional personal election. Then affords us to praise and reverence God for his mercy and grace. It manifests itself in every believer. A life of humility. A life of love. Of carefulness. And especially gratitude. To obey the gospel. Oh, how that is true. There's nothing in ourselves that provoke God to elect us. We are sinners damned and deserving hell itself. And it was God who reached out of heaven to pull us out of hell as it were and to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ and to reconcile us to the Father through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit we are raised up into resurrection life to obey and to glorify God in every aspect of life. There's no arrogance in, in the Reformed Church. But before we conclude on the doctrine of unconditional election, I want to address one criticism that so often is lodged against the Reformed doctrine of unconditional election. And this criticism is more of a demonstration of popular theology. It's more a demonstration of the flesh and the arrogance that so many have in their own heart. This criticism, I say, is a demonstration of popular theology because it is popular to level this criticism that I'm about to address against unconditional election. But this criticism finds no basis either in scripture or in the history of the church. So first, let us let us look at what this criticism is, and it goes something like this. Some have maintained or maintain that election discourages the efforts of evangelism. That election, sovereign, personal election, rips away any desire for prayer. That this doctrine of unconditional election 
discourages against any forms and most forms of missionary work. What missionary would go out on the field believing in unconditional personal election? He'd have to be crazy. As a practical matter, and some of these people who deny unconditional election, that the doctrine of election is discouraging. Or really, it's nothing more than a stumbling block to so many. Have you ever heard that criticism? Oh, I've heard that criticism. I remember when I was in seminary, many years ago. I was so thrilled that on the campus of Dallas Theological Seminary, which is not known for its reformed faith, we were having a brown bag. Now, a brown bag is, uh, you know, is some place where you take your lunch and you go to a particular hall and you eat and a person gives a lecture. And the person that was giving the lecture was a five-point Calvinist. Boy, was I thankful, and in some sense I was proud, that finally on the campus of Dallas, there was somebody who knew what they were talking about. Huh? And the first question that was asked after he gave a wonderful lecture, uh, lecture on election and the doctrines of sovereign grace was, what about missions? What about evangelism and prayer? I couldn't believe it. Here at a graduate school of theology, such a question would have to be addressed. And it was, and he addressed it well. But I'd like to take a chance this Lord's Day to address that issue. Does the Presbyterian and Reformed view of unconditional election prevent or discourage evangelism, prayer, and missions? Well, first of all, we must conclude from the scriptures that this is certainly not in harmony with scripture at all. If election prevented missions or evangelism, we don't see it at all in the Holy Scripture. As a matter of fact, this was not true of our Lord Jesus Christ or the Apostle Paul who wrote one of the greatest chapters on election in the Word of God which is Romans 9 through 11 and Ephesians chapter 1. Outside of our Lord Jesus Christ who always preached on election in John 6 and Matthew 13 to cite only a few passages. I mean, there was even a point in time where Jesus was asked, why do you speak in parables? Well, I'll tell you why. To hide the kingdom and the mysteries from them, lest they believe and repent, and give it unto those who are elected. Wow. Jesus even challenged the disciples in John 6, after he had preached on unconditional election, effectual calling. And people said, this is too difficult to understand. This guy's crazy. And they laughed. And Jesus turns around to his disciples and says, are you going to leave too? Jesus never shied away from the doctrine of election. And neither did the Apostle Paul, who under inspiration of the Holy Spirit was doing nothing but giving the words of Christ. All of Scripture really is nothing more than the word of Christ. The Apostle Paul, for example, is the greatest missionary of the church. Spoke more clearly about election than anyone. He wasn't even afraid to proclaim and to teach the doctrine of election to an infant church. Sometimes you hear that criticism. Well, election's way too deep, way too deep. You go, oh, don't do that, don't do that. The Apostle Paul didn't do that. Did Jesus do that? Maybe we should start walking in the footsteps of our Lord rather than the footsteps of men. For the Apostle, unconditional election gave all the more reason to evangelize in prayer. Listen, for example, to Romans 9, verses 1 through 3. I tell you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow 
and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren. My countrymen according to the flesh. Again, after explaining the doctrine of election so clearly, the apostle wrote in Romans 10 verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's a heart on fire. That's a heart that's prayerful. That's a heart that sees the truth of unconditional election in prayer and in obedience and humility. And so I ask you, if there was ever a Calvinist or Reformed teacher, prayer warrior, missionary, evangelist, greater than the Apostle Paul, I do not know of one. Election never stopped the Apostle Paul from anything. As a matter of fact, election gave him great encouragement and most of all boldness to continue on the things of the Lord. You know, there's a letter that was written to Lewis Berry Chafer. Now, Chafer is the... Uh, person who started Dallas Seminary, the first president and systematic theology teacher. And he was asked by a friend who knew a missionary and knew someone who was going to go out onto the field. And he asked him if he had one thing to, to say to this missionary, what would you say so that I may impart him such great wisdom? Lewis Spirit Chaffer said, does he believe in the doctrine of election? Because the missionary field can be very discouraging unless you really have a hold on the doctrine of election. We can see election bringing great encouragement as in Acts 18, as the Apostle Paul was in the midst of a great discouragement. In Acts 18, Paul is in Corinth, and the Jewish authority had rejected the gospel, and he was discouraged. How did God encourage the Apostle? To not be afraid. Jesus said to the apostle, I am with you. And no one is going to attack you or harm you. Because I have many people in this city. God assures Paul of his presence, his protection, and his election. With this truth, the apostle Paul responds by persevering through the trials of life. As stated in verse 11, for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Now that's perseverance. He didn't pick up his, his knapsack and leave. He didn't take his Bible and say, I'm done, I'm done, too, many, too, many op too much opposition here, I'm out. He stayed there. For a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Why did the apostle Paul suffer so much in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ? This was the apostle's calling, as stated in Acts 9.16, that he was to suffer. That's what the Lord Jesus had said. But how could he keep persevering in, in the gospel message? After being beaten, stoned, ridiculed, and almost left for dead. Paul, are you crazy? Surely this is a senior moment, Paul. Surely this must be God's will that you, that you leave this territory. You just were beaten. You know that dent in the side of your head? That was because of a stone. Surely the apostle was lifted up by the grace of God, but he, but he fulfilled his duty to proclaim the gospel through the eyes of election. We're told this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Listen to these words. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, 
that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I suffer all things. I endure all things. I'm in a battle. I'm in a fight. And I'm with it to the end. And why? For the sake of the elect. You see, I am a means by which the Lord God brings salvation. We see that, for example, in 2 Thessalonians. He says there in verse 14, To which he called you by our gospel. Paul's teaching, Paul's preaching, was the means by which people come to faith in Jesus Christ. It is the evidence of God's electing love to his people. Election did not stop Peter or Luke or Jude or James. So why would this great doctrine discourage us today? Why does it discourage the church? Are we not to follow in our Lord Jesus' steps? Who said in John 6.39... And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. Did you hear those words of Jesus Christ? And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me. unconditional election. Therefore, God's absolute sovereignty is a motivation to evangelize, to pray, and most certainly not to be discouraged in any aspect of life. Discouragement is just not a part of our lives. This is so in, in the scriptures. And this is so in the history of the church as well. Again, you, you often hear that if you preach or believe in a sovereign God who elects according to his good pleasure and rejects others under damnation, it's fatalism. And normally when you hear that, you know that they don't know what fatalism means. Fatalism does not recognize any means and it doesn't recognize a goal. Election, unconditional election, believes in means. The preaching and the teaching of the word of God. And the goal is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. So fatalism and unconditional election are directly opposite to one another. Or sometimes you hear the word thrown around hyper-Calvinism. Which most people, if not all people, don't know how to define that term at all. It's a particular term. But you see, if you believe in the free offer of the gospel, then you can't be hyper-Calvinistic. If God has decreed who will be saved, they say, the decree, that which is irresistible, then why bother to obey Christ's great commission and bring the gospel to all the world? The reason why we do that is because it's biblical. That's the primary reason why we believe in unconditional election, because it's biblical. And if you have a problem with unconditional election, then you have a problem not with me or this church, but you have a problem with the Bible. You have a problem with our Lord. But you see, these, these criticisms, why pray, why preach, has no foundation in Scripture, but nor does it have it in the history of the church. In the history of the church, there were great missionaries and schools of higher learning established by Calvinistic or Reformed denominations. The Reformation was started really as an evangelistic tool to get the church back to its biblical roots of pure doctrine and worship and expanding the kingdom of God. The Reformation is, was an evangelistic tool the Lord brought the reformation of the church about through evangelistic zeal. 
an unfailing courage of men who believe that God is fully sovereign in salvation. You think of Martin Luther and William Tyndale and Calvin and Knox and Brainerd and countless others. So from Augustine to Jonathan Edwards, from the Puritans to the Presbyterian and Reformed, from Heidelberg and Cambridge to Harvard and Princeton, from Calvin to Top Lady, are all examples of the Calvinistic impulse to preach and teach the gospel. All the major institutions, particularly of universities and colleges of the United States, were founded upon sovereign grace and Calvinistic theology. One time I went to Princeton and walked through the hallowed halls of Princeton is always good. And there we went into Nassau Hall and I encourage you to go to Nassau Hall. And there up on the wall, way up on the top, sat the portrait of Jonathan Edwards, the original portrait, who was the president of the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton. And there was Eshbel Green in his portrait. And you'd look up there and you'd say, the Lord God, how things have changed. I said to the security guy that was there, I said, you know, that picture right up on top up there should be brought down here. He said, who's that? And I said, that's Jonathan Edwards. He speaks, though dead, he speaks today. Another example in history is the evangelist George Whitfield, 1714 to 1770, who preached to thousands of people in the First Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening in the United States, up and down the, the East Coast border, from New Brunswick all the way down to, to Savannah, Georgia. The work of the sovereign grace of God. I remember reading one time where Jonathan Edwards had said during this first great awakening, he said, I knew that there was something going on when people were beginning to talk after church about my sermon rather than about their occupation. Whitfield was a great preacher, preacher of that day, of the first great awakening, capable of gospel preaching and commanding thousands on two continents, both England and here, through the sheer power of the Word of God. In Whitfield's lifetime, he preached at least 18,000 times and over to 10 million hearers. Calvinists reform. Again, you think that the evangelist and orphanage overseer George Mueller 1805 to 1898. Mueller once called the doctrine of election a devilish doctrine. As Mueller continued to study the scriptures, he came to the conclusion that sovereign grace is the only grace in the word of God. Mueller wrote in his autobiography, to my great astonishment I found that the passages which speak decisively for election and persevering grace were about four times as many as those who speak apparently against these truths. And even those few shortly after, when I examined and understood them, served to confirm me in the above doctrines, the doctrine of unconditional election. The one that he called, well, this is a devilish doctrine. Now it became a doctrine of Holy Scripture and important to his heart. Sovereign Grace Congregation ignited and fueled Mueller's evangelistic zeal, a spiritual father to well over 10,000 orphans, and preaching the Word of God as an itinerant evangelist, taking the gospel to well over 12 different countries. Mueller's example, as others as well, is one of many powerful answers to those who would allege that support of God's sovereignty and unconditional election extinguishes evangelism. It's amazing to me. You've got this little French guy in Geneva. He starts an academy. Why does he start the academy? You've got this little French guy in Geneva who writes a, a book called The Institutes. And he addresses King Francis 
You see, John Calvin, that little French guy, his heart was for his French people. He was a stranger in a strange land in Geneva. And many times, he sent his students back to France, and they never came back because they were murdered. They became martyrs. It's incredible that if you just simply keep telling a lie long enough, it seems like people just simply believe it in the face of Scripture and in the face of history. The Word of God and history testify to the truth that unconditional election is the fire behind all of us in the truth of the gospel. Unconditional personal election congregation is the fountain of every saving good that Dort said over and over again. And we've said to you that if, you're, that if you wanted to capsulize the whole doctrine of unconditional election, may those words in Dort 1 Article 1, or Article 9, Canon 1, be sealed upon our hearts. That the doctrine of unconditional election is the fountain of every saving good from which proceeds faith and holiness and other fruits of salvation and finally eternal life. The doctrine incites the greatest form of faith. A faith that is expressed in loving service and gratitude. And finally, congregation... Maybe, maybe we ought to put it down where the rubber meets the road. Maybe we could say it this way. The next person you pray for or share the gospel, the next person you sit next to on the bus or in the classroom may be the one of God's elect. And you may be the means by which that person comes to salvation in Jesus Christ. This is true of our friends. This is true of churchgoers, children, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers. Since sovereign, unconditional, personal election never stopped our Lord Jesus or the Apostle Paul from evangelism and prayer, so it will inspire and encourage us today. And then finally, by the way, if there is a question in your heart today, whether you are one of God's elect, then you could settle the whole issue right now. Repent of your sins. Believe and rest in Jesus Christ. And that's how you know you're one of the elect. As Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, may God bless this great doctrine to our hearts and may he bless the preaching of his word this dark day. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we realize that as we study this great doctrine, there are many mysteries. But, oh Lord God, how true it is. It is a biblical doctrine that you have given to us so graciously in the scriptures and through the example of all the prophets, through the example of the Apostle Paul, and oh Lord, through Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, not to be cowards, but to stand up for the truth in declaring that wonderful doctrine that proclaims you as the sovereign Lord God that you are. You are in control of all things. To the natural man, that may, they may sound repugnant. But to those who are saved in Jesus Christ, there's no greater doctrine than to be called, justified, sanctified, and glorified by your sovereign purposes. O oh Lord God, bring us to a sense of gratitude in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.